Each year we use uh, this time to focus on a quote from his famous speech, uh, the I Have a Dream speech, as you know. Uh, that one, and the quote is that one day my four little children will live in a country where they are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. It's a tradition at BCC to celebrate Dr. King's legacy on the day set aside uh, to remember that legacy. It's appropriate for us to do so because of uh, what Dr. King held dear is what Bristol Community College uh, holds dear. Uh, that social justice, equality, opportunity, and especially at Bristol, a uh, better life through education, uh, were all standards and goals for us. This breakfast brings together the community uh, to stage a grand celebration. Uh, we have several partners from the community who will help to, uh, uh, with this commemoration, and we'll get to them, of course. Uh, but uh, I'd like to welcome, uh, if I could, just to get us started, um, Reverend Daryl Malden, pastor of uh, Bethel AME Church, who will provide our invocation. Reverend Malden. Reverend Malden is uh, uh, called to say he would be late. Uh, uh, by the way, he is the pastor of Bethel AME Church on Hanover Street, and I remind you, and I will later, that there is a uh, ecumenical service at Bethel AME. Uh, not immediately following this, but at 11.30. I hope you can make it uh, for, that, uh, for that occasion. Uh, in the meantime, we have a new, brand new person at BCC to help us with this invocation, and Cal Dr. Calvin McMadden, who is our Dean of uh, Social Sciences and uh, Behavioral Sciences. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, he's within a month, a month of uh, his employment at the college, and he's an old veteran now. Uh, at BCC, and uh, I invite uh, D uh, Dr. McFadden to uh, provide our invocation. Calvin McFadden. Thank you, President Stone. Good morning. Won't you join me with a word of prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for the beauty of this day, and we thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you for this great occasion that we celebrate the life of the drum major for justice, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., we give you thanks, O oh God, for his life and for his legacy. And we're especially proud, O oh God, of the fact that he indeed made a difference in the life of this country. We're thankful, O oh God, for this great celebration at the Bristol Community College, and we thank you for the planning committee and all these, your people, who gather together for this breakfast. We pray, O oh God, that whatever we do would be done for your glory, and that indeed the dream will no longer remain a dream, but it indeed will become a reality. We ask that you would bless the food that has been so richly prepared for us. Let it be nourishment to our bodies as we continue to give you service. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Calvin. Well, uh, what we're going to do now is uh, have enough speaking. That's enough for now. Isn't it? Uh, and we're going to go ahead and, uh, and eat and partake of our free community breakfast. Uh, uh, please uh, wait until your table is invited to go through the line and then we'll pick up after, after that. Okay, so again, thank you very much for coming and enjoy the day. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, how about that food? Everybody enjoy themselves? Good food, good company. How many of you New Englanders had grits? Huh? <laughs> you know what grits are? <laughs> Okay, well, I think we're ready to, to roll here. We'll get started. Uh, uh, this is a great crowd and a, 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 always a great occasion. I can't believe it's been 13 years since we inaugurated this event, and every year it seems to get stronger and stronger. So that breakfast was terrific. And right now, I'd like to introduce uh, Sharon Mazik, uh, who will start our program with a selection that was Dr. King's favorite hymn, Precious Lord. And following her song, we will enjoy a special performance in honor of the 50th anniversary uh, of the march on, uh, on Birmingham. Not, not Selma, but Birmingham. OK, so if you would welcome, please welcome Sharon. Thank you. 
Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, and let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn through. To the light, take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me on home when my way grows drear, precious Lord. Linger near when my life is all almost gone. Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall. my hand, precious Lord, and lead me on I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will one day be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day be a part of a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with all its vicious racists and its governor having his lips dripping with the words, with the words of interposition and nullification. It's right there in Alabama. Little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see together. together. This will be the day when all of God's children can sing with a new meaning. My country, tis of thee. Sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, 
land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, then this must be true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Luck freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Luck freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, luck freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Luck freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Luck freedom ring from every hill and more hill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, luck freedom ring. And when this happens, when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, when we able to be able to speed up the day when all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, we will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you, those were uh, BCC students, and uh, how about a round of applause again for them? <clears throat> Like uh, to call uh, Ron uh, Weisberger went down and sat down, but come on back up, Ron, and uh, mention something about the uh, the march on uh, on Birmingham, if you would. We had we heard from Sharon. We'll hear. I'm glad to say we'll hear from Sharon again, and uh, we heard from our BCC students. Uh, and now I, I wanted to recognize Ron. Uh, if you just raise your hand, Ron. Uh, Ron is going to. I uh, wanted to mention to you that uh, one of our distinguished. Uh, historians uh, at the college. Ron is going to offer a uh, course uh, on uh, the writings and the uh, teachings and ideas of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And, uh, and that you'll be able to register for that course, free course, the college is paying for that, uh, uh, here in, in the auditorium after the, uh, after the ceremony. So Ron, I thank you for, uh, for doing that. Thank you. This is the uh, 50th anniversary of the March on Birmingham. It is also the uh, 150th anniversary this month of the implementation of the Emancipation Proclamation and uh, uh, the proclamation by President Abraham Lincoln. So uh, it's quite an event and uh, uh, quite a time for historical uh, uh, memory. And uh, something that we don't ever want to lose is the, uh, the ideals and the vision of, uh, of Dr. King. Uh, our breakfast, uh, I also want to introduce some people to you uh, before we go any further, uh, kind of in the order that they signed in, if you would. Uh, we have uh, Dave Dennis from the Fall River City Council. Uh, Dave Dennis. <laughs> State Representative Chris Markey. We have, uh, uh, we have State Representative Paul Schmidt. State Representative David Sullivan. We have Janet LaBelle, who is representing Senator John Kerry. Perhaps soon to be Defense Secretary, right? <laughs> we have Glenda Isagare from uh, Congressman Keating's office. Glenda? There you go. Thank you, Glenda. Uh, we have, let's see, uh, Representative Steve Howitt. Uh, did I mention Steve? Yeah. We have Rob Kidd, who is representing District Attorney Sam Sutter. Rob. From the New Bedford City Council, Jack Livermento. Jack. Okay. 
We have from the uh, school committee and Fall River, uh, Joseph Martin, Dr. Martin. And from our BCC Board of Trustees, we have our chairperson, uh, Fernando Garcia. And Trustee Cynthia Rose. Also, like to introduce uh, uh, three uh, uh, teachers from our uh, K through 12 and participated in the uh, poster contest. I hope you had a chance to enjoy them uh, out on display in the lobby. Linda Liker from uh, Whitney Academy. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Linda. <laughs> Sandra Arnold from Cuss Middle. Sandra. And Jackie Arnfield from Whitney Academy. Jackie, okay. and I always like to say after these introductions, uh, did I miss anyone important? <laughs> anyone important want to stand up and introduce themselves? Thank you. I hope I haven't forgotten anyone, but uh, thank you for signing in and uh, we'll move forward with that. Uh, our breakfast also serves today as a uh, Bristol uh, Community College's kickoff for uh, African American History Month. You know, this day, uh, like Af African American History Month, I'm always a little perturbed that we have a set time period uh, for this or that. One day for Martin Luther King, 28 or 29 days for uh, African American History Month, uh, when it should be a, a, you know, a 24, 7, 365 day celebration of our diversity. Uh, we have Women's Week, I think, and Hispanic Month, and I don't even know about the time frames. Uh, we have a morning for this and an afternoon for that. Uh, but they should, uh, they should not have these time limits on them, and uh, uh, we have to move forward to keep, uh, keep these, uh, the legacies alive, the rich heritage uh, that we have as uh, diversity. You know, at Bristol Community College, we have 50 countries plus Puerto Rico uh, represented at little old Bristol here. Uh, so they add to the flavor, they add to the education of our students uh, and to our staff and employees. We all benefit from their presence. Uh, so uh, African American History Month, uh, we hope you'll take advantage of the events that we've scheduled so far in February and there'll be more coming. Uh, you can see all of the events on our website and you will find the address uh, in your programs. Uh, the, uh, also, this is another historic day, uh, the inauguration uh, celebration of the first African-American uh, American president, right? National United States president, uh, President Obama. Uh, he seems to be... <laughs> he seems to be setting a pattern of having multi-inaugurations. Uh, uh, yesterday uh, is the 20th, that's the official day, and today will be the ceremony. I think he did, that happened in 09 as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, the free credit course, I, t I didn't mention that it starts on uh, March 5th, and uh, Dr. Weisberger will be uh, working on that. It's a great opportunity for you to, uh, to uh, take advantage of the ideal and the legacy of Dr. King. This event, by the way, today is organized by uh, our African American uh, uh, History uh, Committee, as well as our Martin Luther, we have a special Martin Luther King Committee. And, I want to introduce uh, Tafa Awalaju and Sally Cameron as our co-chairs. There they are, there they are. Time to get a chance to eat. <laughs> Jane Ash, Jane Ash, there we go. Milton Clement, Milton, there you go. Nicole Coleman Park, Nicole, there she is. Liz McCarthy, Elizabeth. Cindy Poor Parasol. Cindy, Bobby Zendis, Kevin Spurlett, Kevin, Linda Baveros, and Ron Weisberger, whom you've met. Uh, now, I know they look like it, they're very rich and they get paid for this, but actually they don't, okay? <laughs> they're volunteers and they, and they give them themselves uh, time, talent, and treasure uh, as they do this every year, and we're very grateful to them. We couldn't have something as monumental an undertaking as this event uh, without their, uh, uh, their tremendous commitment and dedication and, and talent. I also want to acknowledge our musicians today. It's such a wonderful atmosphere. 
We have, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Louis Lehman and Michael Crowley. They really, they really like to get Okay. This breakfast has become a community tradition in Greater Fall River, and I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, our, uh, our, our leader, if you will, in Fall River, Mayor Will Flanagan, who will bring greetings in a few minutes uh, for the city. And as I mentioned earlier, we are joined in our sponsorship of this annual breakfast by the city of, uh, of Fall River, which helps us with a very important part of the event, our annual middle, uh, middle school poster contest. I uh, hope you took an opportunity to see those posters in the uh, prominently displayed in our lobby. Uh, and uh, we have teachers and administrators from the various schools. So uh, at this point, uh, I want to recognize the winners of our poster contest and also hear some uh, words of welcome from our mayor. Uh, it's my honor to introduce to you Mayor Will Flanagan. Mayor Flanagan. Thank you, Dr. Sprager, and it's an honor uh, to be back here at BCC. And for 13 years, uh, BCC has been hosting this annual Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, breakfast. And it's a great opportunity uh, for people throughout our region uh, to gather here and to pay tribute uh, to MLK. And if you take a moment just to reflect on his life and his service to our nation, uh, a man who through nonviolent means was able to unite a country and was able to fight for equality. And with the swearing in of uh, President Barack Obama today during his inauguration, you can see how as a nation, uh, the work and the passion of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, has come forward here in our country. And for a moment, I was just taking a second to go through the program, and I want to recognize both the keynote speaker, Donald Montero, and the 2013 Distinguished African American alumnus, Mohammed Kantai, and just to say uh, congratulations on your work in the community uh, and what you've been able to accomplish. Uh, your work has really shown and pay tribute uh, to the work of Martin Luther King Jr. And I think both of you being here today are very fitting, especially on this day. And another part I like about this breakfast is we get an opportunity to recognize our students. Uh, our students, through their art teachers, come together each year and they do an outstanding job in paying tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. through their artistic talent. And it's always fun for myself and, and President Sprager to recognize the students uh, for their hard work. And each winner receives a gift certificate and a prize. And I'm going to start off with the third place winners, each of whom will receive a $30 gift card. And I'm going to call them up to the podium one by one. And the first student is Olivia Peck Soto from Morton Middle School. Olivia. <laughs> Now we'll be joined by Mark O'Curry from Morton Middle School. Mark. And we don't have your last name, but it's Michael from Whitney Academy. Michael. And we have from the Cuss Middle School, Audrey Figueredo. Audrey.
from the Cusp Middle School, Stephen Almeida. Stephen? Also from the Cus Middle School, Jessica Torres. Jessica? second place we have honorable mentions and from the Cus Middle School James Werner also from Cus Middle School Abigail Callahan Honorable mention to Matthew Collier from Cuss Middle School. <laughs> Honorable mention to Ironis Suarez from the Cuss Middle School. And our last honorable mention before we move on to second place is awarded to Kaylee Traylor from the Cuss Middle School. Kaylee. to our second place winners and they receive a $40 gift card and the first second place winner is Alyssa Sherman from the Cuss Middle School. And our Second second place winner to receive a $40 gift card is Alexis Moniz from Cus Middle School. Alexis. to our first prize winner who will receive a $50 gift card plus a gift certificate to the Kids College here at Bristol Community College. And the first prize is being awarded to a student at Cuss Middle School, Jessica Mello. Jessica? We can have another round of applause for our students as well as our teachers and thank them for being here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, very appreciative of the uh, time and, uh, that the uh, in instructors take and that the students take uh, to keep this, uh, this very important uh, uh, event alive uh, in the middle schools because of the uh, we, I hope that this will be a lasting uh, a memory for them. And it uh, reminds me that we have little ones here today, too, and I hope they won't forget uh, this event and uh, the legacy that uh, we're here to celebrate. Well, the Distinguished African-American Alumni 
Award is presented yearly uh, by the BCC Alumni Association to recognize outstanding achievement. And here to introduce the award winner for this year is Peter Silva, class of 73, uh, from our BCC Alumni Association. Peter? So good morning to each of you. Okay. My name is Peter Silva, class of 73. I am the vice chair of the uh, BCC Alumni Association, which is sponsoring uh, the, this, this Distinguished African Alumnus Award. <clears throat> Before I continue, uh, I would like to acknowledge Pam Culinary. She's our, our chairperson, and uh, she had intended to be here this morning, but due to a family emergency, she was called away. So let's hope for the best outcome there. So I am honored to uh, represent BCC Alumni Association and give the uh, 2013 uh, award to uh, Mohamed Conte. He is the uh, class of 2007. And he graduated from the uh, engineering program here. Okay, now it's, it's important to remember that his, his base uh, for engineering started here. Okay? Uh, after much hard work and perseverance, uh, he eventually graduated from Northeastern University in 2012. And he is now employed at uh, EMC Corporation in Hopkinton, Mass. Now, for those of you who don't know about EMC, it is the world's largest manufacturer of mainframe computers uh, used for data storage. Okay, this is a very eminent company. Uh, I know because I have it in my portfolio. You know, so, uh, <laughs> good job, Mohammed. <laughs> So Muhammad is being honored today, uh, just five short years after BCC, because of, what he had, because of what he has achieved at Northeastern. He was a member of a team of engineering students who were working on their senior capstone project. Uh, and that project was inspired by Muhammad's uh, life in Fall River and at BCC. So to tell the rest of the story, I'm going to quote from one of the, uh, uh, the nominations that was submitted for his nomination for Muhammad. Okay, I'm going to quote from that. So during one of our conversations, while he was a student at BCC, Mr. Conte told me about one of his experiences and observations at a local nursing home. It was that where he was working then. Uh, the nursing home residents had no visitors, and he expressed sadness, not only about their loneliness, but also about their total, their total dependence on virtual strangers uh, to meet all of their physical needs, such as quadriplegics who can't even feed themselves. So this person goes on to say, when I learned this summer from a segment on CNN about Mr. Conte's team project, I was, I was not surprised. According to that report, the device, this is a device uh, that with, with eye contact, it engages a, ro a robotic arm, just with eye contact. Okay? This was intended to provide some kind of entertainment like Facebook for quadriplegics. But Mr. Conte soon realized that this device could be designed as a tool for paraplegics to feed themselves. Uh, this device was actually brought to one of the patients in Fall River, and the patient was act that quadriplegic was actually able to feed themselves with this device. By looking with the eye to the object, the, the robotic arm retrieves like the food, and the person can feed themselves. Now, should this device that him and his team created uh, be marketed, and it is, it is right now in the patent process, okay, it would be a significant contribution uh, to the community of thousands of people with severe handicaps. I would like to present this year's Distinguished African American Alumnus Award to Mr. Mohamed Conte.
truly honored and humbled. At the same time, I feel like you all should be standing in here with me to receive this award because you are the reason why I made it this far in life. What I want to encourage you to do is keep your focus on students and keep encouraging them because I know you can change this world one student at a time. I'm going to cover two things today, the acknowledgement and the next step I will take from here. The question I have been asking myself for a while is, how did I get here? It turns out that there is more to that answer than just trying, passion, and hard work. I am the recipient of what Malcolm Gladwell refers to as extraordinary opportunities and hidden advantages that enabled me to, to make sense of this word the way I do. For instance, when I was, back when I was an international student, one of the troubles that I used to have the most was to come up with the money for the tuition. Now, thanks to the BCC Foundation, Jane, even back then I thought she was part of the, to the, to the BCC Foundation, Diane West, Kelly, and Jackie. I can't find <laughs> Oh, there you are. <laughs> and Jackie, who was always ready to help me when there was a need. Even when I transferred out of BCC to another institution, I had the same problem. But unfortunately, I didn't have these folks with me, Diane, Jane, and Kelly. So I found myself all out of status. One Friday morning, a gentleman called me by the name of Tim Harvin. I still remember his name from the Department of Homeland Security saying, it has been brought to my attention that you are out of status and you have two weeks to leave the United States. Failure to do so would make you a subject to deportation. For those of you who are not aware of that word deportation, it's the most frightening word of an international student, especially for somebody who wants to get it done. Nicole Haney, I haven't seen her this morning, but she became my social worker, making phone calls after phone calls, suggestion after suggestion. And during the first conversation, I still remember when she said, this would be such a shame because you are so brilliant. Now, whether she really believed this or not, whether I really believed this or not, I did not want to prove her wrong. So I find myself striving to be successful, to, make, to be worthy of her confidence in me as well. Many of you <coughs> said similar things to motivate me. So I would like to take some time to thank him publicly and personally. Thanks to Anthony Uchi, who where he all started with, he influenced my choice of the engineering curriculum. Thanks to Nicole, who not only for her guidance, but she really encouraged me. Ron Weisberg, he gave me a job at Task, and he was ready to co-sign my student loan, along with his wife, Pat. Regina Pirtle, I haven't seen her today neither, but she is the one who used to point out my grammatical error in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> Can't forget that. And Greg Satharis, thank you for your, for your time and dedication for my honors projects. The late Sandra Boone, God bless your soul. And my good friend, Roland Fumadum, who was always supportive. Catherine Adamowitz, Oh, there she is. <laughs> Thank you. And Cindy Poor Parasol and the Office of Disability Services. Thank you for your support. I would also like to thank Fatmata Dambele, my siblings, my parents, Mohamed Tomota. The, the little Adama and <laughs> and Patos. 
Thank you. All these folks, among so many others, influence who I am today because they believed in me. I didn't just fake it till I, be, till I made it. I faked it till I became it. <laughs> Looking forward, I'm scared. Scared because I have to maintain this momentum and do great things so that you don't look back on this award and say, oh boy, was this a mistake? <laughs> now, that's not about to happen because this award would give me the credibility and the exposure that I need for my future projects. As far as future projects, I'm still working on iCraft, the device that he just mentioned. It will be available to the public and the next version will dazzle you. Also, I created a nonprofit organization, a project called iNerd. iNerd stands for New Education for Radical Development. It would empower young Malians and encourage them to be innovative, to create a long-lasting economic growth. The iNerd would change Malian from passive technology users to active makers of technology that would impact the community. Because I understand nobody can find a solution to their problem better than, than, than themselves. It will then promote a constant innovation by rewarding innovators and providing them with in intellectual property rights. Because I believe only when in, uh, intellectual property is firmly protected and the innovators are properly rewarded that innovators will start sharing their knowledge. They say in order to predict the future, you have to take part of, of its creation. I predict an Africa with an industrial revolution, which will then stimulate a lasting economic growth. Simon Sinek said, if you talk about what you believe, you would attract those who believe what you believe. I hope I was able to do that today. I would, like to leave you to the, I would like to leave you with a thank you, not just for this award, but for listening to me and making me who I am today. Thank you. Thank you for those Great inspiring job. words. You, uh, you can see, I always say that you can go anywhere from BCC, and uh, Mohammed's uh, journey uh, continues after he left BCC. I hope that copyright comes in. He'll be hearing from our resource development office. Right? <laughs> but, uh, it, and, the, and the people that he mentioned are uh, uh, symbolic, if you will, because I know we could mention many other uh, people here at BCC who spurred him forward. Uh, and it just gives you an indication uh, of the BCC family, uh, the, uh, the cohesion that we have, the single-minded purpose that we have of moving forward, uh, changing the world, learner by learner. Student success is our most important priority, and uh, Mohammed is a shining example of that. Thank you, Mohammed. <clears throat> Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our main speaker, uh, Donald, uh, Dr. Donald Montero. He was a Navy corpsman who served in Vietnam uh, with the Marines and Navy. He received the Navy Commendation Medal. He began his college education, I'm glad to say, at a community college, Cape Cod Community College, and made great use of his community college start <clears throat> by moving on to Boston University and UMass Medical School. Dr. Montero, who received the Cape Cod Community College Citizen of the Year Award, is a physician in private practice, and we're honored to have him uh, uh, come and address uh, our community breakfast. Uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Donald R. Montero. My God, it's gonna to be tough today. 
I think you already heard the keynote speaker. <laughs> but welcome, what a beautiful day. Mr. President, distinguished guests, family and friends. Today we're gonna to begin on a journey. A journey looking at Martin Luther King, I'll call him Dr. King, I'll call him MLK, but bear with me. Bear with me as I go. Martin Luther King was born in January 14, 1929. He would be 84 years old today. He died at the age of 39, 45 years ago. For 39 years is a very short time. And here we are today. Martin Luther King said, one day there'll be a black president in the United States. Here we are today with the second swearing in of Obama. Isn't that something? Isn't that where we came from? This is where the dream began. This is where he said, let freedom ring, let freedom ring. I'm coming over here to you students because I'm really impressed with you guys. There's from Cuss, I guess it's Morton, and Whitney. This is the future. This is the dream. The dream is over. When Martin Luther King went to Washington to speak, he stood up there and he said, I'm coming to Washington today to bring a check that the United States government promised all mankind. Equality, freedom, and hopefully liberty. He brought the check. He said when the check was written, there wasn't enough funds. He was right. They tried to cash it numerous times. And let's go back. And let's look at Martin Luther King's life in reverse in the rearview mirror, something that Martin Luther King didn't do. Martin Luther King didn't live in the past, because if he did, he still would be in chains. He looked, he said, there's chains, and I'm out. He lived for the future, because he was a dreamer. That was his nickname, the dreamer. And he lived that way, because he believed in today and tomorrow, not yesterday. But we're going to reflect on him, because he's an interesting, very interesting man. We'll look in the rearview mirror, and we're going to come to, hopefully, today. And as we go through this, try to put yourself in his place. He was a man of nonviolence. He wasn't. He was taught by Gandhi. Or should I say he followed his teaching. Unfortunately, Gandhi was killed before he got to India. He never had the opportunity to meet him. But he did walk in his footsteps. He did see what he did in India, and nonviolence was his way. So let's go back to 1929 when Martin Luther King was born. And again, remember we're looking in the rearview mirror, not for long because that's not Martin's way. He was born in 1929 on January the 14th. Today's the 24th, 21st. Actually, it was on the 14th as his real birthday. He was a young man, he had a lot of energy. He never sat still. Martin Luther King was not really involved in, in religion. His grandfather was a minister, his father was a minister, and he went on to become a minister. And how he got involved is his sister one day, remind me, I only got 20 minutes, so when it gets about 19, just tell me it's over. And what he did is that his sister joined into the church so he was not going to be outdone by his sister, of course. So the very next day he joined. So that was the beginning. And how did Martin get involved in the understanding of freedom and justice and injustice? Well, he had a little playmate across from where he lived. And it was a, a store owner, his son. And they were great friends. Until they were about six years old and they entered school. And unfortunately, the young boy was white. And the father told his son, you can no longer play with Martin. And of course, Martin went home devastated. Could not understand this. He hated everybody. He hated the store owner. He hated all whites. He thought that this was unjust. But in the process, he also learned it was wrong to hate. And it was a beginning in him. And there were many stories like this, and we could go on forever. But this was the beginning. Martin was a bright young man. He went to Booker T. High School. He stayed there until he was about, I don't know, I think he was 15 when he went to Morehouse. Am I correct? He was two years ahead of his time. He was very young, very immature. 
but he survived. He was compulsive because he, everybody always thought that being black, you'd always be late. So he would make sure that he was always on time. And if he wasn't on time, he was really distraught. He stayed at Morehouse. From Morehouse, he went on to the seminary. From there, he went on to Boston University. Boston University was very, very important to him because this is where he met Mrs. King. How did he do that? He asked somebody, find me a pretty girl. And actually, they gave him a number. He called her, and he took his little jalopy and went over, and that was the beginning. And he speaks very highly of his wife, and unfortunately, we won't have a lot of time to talk about Mrs. King. But she was very instrumental. She was there when he needed her. She was there to give him the support. She was there when they were under fire. Their house was bombed twice, if you remember. Bombed twice. Unfortunately, no one was hurt. So Martin now, he comes out of BU, and he was offered many positions. He could be a teacher. He could have been a pastor with his father, Ebenezer. He chose Dexter, Baptist Church. That's where he wanted to go. And this was the beginning, because when he went there, the bourgeoisie, or those who thought they were better, even in the church, there was internal segregation. Because the people who belonged to Dexter were supposedly the people of money. Martin says, no more of this. No more of this. And I think he got this from Gandhi, because Gandhi was fighting the same thing in his country. It was called the untouchables. These were people you could not touch in the country. He began to adopt this equality, this role of nonviolence. So it began in his church. But then again, in 1950, 1955, comes along this feisty old lady. And you know who I'm talking about, don't you? Rosa Parks. There's no way that this black lady is going to get up. She said, not today. I'm not getting up to give no white man or anyone this seat. I'm equal to you. I'm paraphrasing. And that was the beginning of Martin Luther King's involvement, busing. Busing was very important. And of course, Rosa Parks went to jail. And Martin Luther King got involved. When we talk about jail, there was a lot of things that went on. It wasn't only Martin Luther King. It was, it was Abernathy. There were a multitude of people. One of the people that we don't talk about was Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte was called upon to give the money to get them out of jail. And remember, Martin went to jail many times. He didn't have to go to jail. He went to jail because he said, if you can go to jail, I must go too. And he did go to jail. So anyhow, busing, and it worked very well. They, they boycotted, they walked, and it was remarkable. One young man came home, and it was an inspiration to Martin. And his father said, you won't get involved with those people. You're not going to be out there with these radicals. And he looked at his father, and he said, Dad, I'm doing this for you, for freedom, and you know what? I'll take the punishment, because I'm going anyhow. So let freedom ring. Freedom was coming from the youth. Freedom was coming from everywhere. Else. And it was all with nonviolence. You talk about Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael. Unfortunately, Martin Luther King, this is where he plays a couple, little funny role. He never liked my, uh, Malcolm X, but he did like him because it was a contrast, because it actually made his job easier, because on one side there was violence, and on the other side there was nonviolence. And if we achieved what we could with nonviolence, it made the violence actually help his cause. He would never talk to Malcolm X, but one day he did talk to Malcolm X, and it was at, in Washington. They were, happened to be in Washington, and they had a brief conversation. And Martin only told him, I believe in nonviolence, not violence. And, but he also knew that Malcolm X was actually an asset, even though they looked like they were not really on the same page. Stokely Carmichael, he didn't really get along with Stokely Carmichael, because on one of the marches, Stokely Carmichael coined the slogan, Black Power. And Martin Luther King said, no way. Look out here. You have seen blacks and whites marching together. You have seen whites die for the cause. How can we have black power? I believe in black power, but it is not in the way you present it. They had a long discussion. It went on for 24, 36 hours before Stokey finally said, okay, we won't do it. Not doing this much. 
All right, so now where were we with Martin Luther King? Martin Luther King had done the busing. And then there were multiple movements that went on. There was uh, Birmingham, there was Chicago. One of them that really bothered him was Watts. Watts was terrible. There was so much violence, so much hatred, so much killing, so much wasting of lives. Martin couldn't participate in that. Martin didn't like it. When he went there, the angry young people, and he fought very hard. He was very disappointed in that. But the movement that really got him, because now I come back to my students, was the sit-ins. That was primarily students. They came from schools. They were kind of they were kind of smart though. They were really cool. Because the schools wanted to lock them in so they couldn't get out. So what they would do is they would jump over the fence. Then when the police came around to surround them and hold them where they were, what they would do is they would send 25 to the front door. The police would go there with their dogs and everything else to stop them. And while they were stopping them, they were filing out two by two on the other side and they were going downtown having their sit-ins at the lunch encounters. This was in the stores that they weren't allowed to have any access to and they were very successful. And Martin was very impressed with them that they adhered to nonviolence. To be with Martin, he, he really demanded that nonviolence had to be the answer or he, had, he really didn't want you to participate. So nonviolence was taught. 1968, Martin Luther King won the Nobel Peace Prize. He went, he got the award. $54,000 was the award at that time. He came back and he gave all the money back to the movement. And the sad part about it, he had gone there, received the award, and I think less than 30 days he was in jail. So here was a man that traveled the world, got the Nobel Peace Prize, and now he was in jail. Kind of strange. But that's what, that's what he did. He believed in nonviolence, and he lived by it, and he died by it. There was a multiple attempts on Martin Luther King's life. He was in New York. Strange. He was at Harlem. He was signing the stride toward freedom, right? And unfortunately, a lady came up to him and said, are you Martin Luther King? He said, yes. And she stabbed him almost into his heart. She was inches or millimeters away from the aorta. When he went to the hospital, the doctor said, if he sneeze, he'll die. It took 24 hours for them to get the team together to remove the knife from Martin Luther King's chest. Martin, Martin didn't, couldn't understand it was still there. 24 hours later, nobody would tell him that he was just a sneeze away from death. Well, the next day, they took him to the operating room, and they did take out the knife, and he did live, and there were no complications. And during his recovery, he received letters from all over the world. There was one letter that he cherished the most. It was a six-year-old girl. From, from school, she wrote a note. She said, Martin, I'm glad you didn't sneeze. You didn't die, and I'm glad you're alive. And oh, by the way, I happen to be white, but that shouldn't matter. That was the letter that Martin cherished the most. Martin loved the youth. Martin's challenge and in, in, in drive for freedom and equality wasn't about black, it wasn't about white, it was about all mankind. And he, he, he lived by that. At this time, you know, Martin also had opportunity to meet with many, many, how much, what, what time am I at? <laughs> 15 minutes to go. I got, <laughs> Martin, Martin was, Martin met many presidents, and which is, you know, he stayed out of politics. He could have swayed the votes many times. He chose not to use that power. Eisenhower, he petitioned Eisenhower to come to the South to give a talk. Eisenhower, he figured, general, just got to kick and butt all over Europe. He must come. Eisenhower wouldn't come. And he said, Eisenhower had his heart in the right spot, 
but he didn't have any courage up front. But there was one thing that Eisenhower did do. He wasn't totally, totally aloof from everything. Eisenhower sent the troops to integrate the schools. So Eisenhower did do something. And then along came Kennedy. He said Kennedy had no idea about who a black man was. He had no contact because he was privileged and came from money. But Martin Luther King was going to jail every other day. So of course Bobby Kennedy and John Kennedy were on the phone trying to get Martin Luther King out of jail every other day. So they began to develop a relationship. And then President Kennedy helped pass the Civil Rights Bill. That was Kennedy's. So there was some good that came out of Kennedy. Then came along, after the assassination of President Kennedy, Johnson took over. Now Johnson took over and he had the Vietnam War. Here we had black men, we had Latinos, we had Asians, and anybody else that was in between. Over in Vietnam, dying for a cause of justice, freedom, liberty, and happiness. And here we were, in America. Didn't have it. Didn't have it. Martin couldn't see that. But Martin would not speak out about the war because he wasn't going to divide the nation. Nor was he going to be political. But then Martin started to look at it a different way. He says, not only is it our people, it's the Vietnamese. They're suffering. Their kids are dying. They're not able to do what they need to do to children. He went to Johnson and asked Johnson, and this was where he probably for the first time I saw that he was becoming political, and he asked Johnson to stop the war. He wanted him out of Vietnam. He now became uh, uh, an advocate of stopping the war. And a lot of people turned on him and said, you need to mind your business. Stick with one or the other. You can't do both. Martin says, I can't stop until freedom is not only here, not only there, but around the world. He says they're all people under God. We're all equal. No matter what you say, we're equal. And therefore, I will not stop. And I will speak, because this is unjust. Johnson gave us the voting right, if you remember. And then we link in, as we talked about today, in January, the 13th Proclamation was passed, the Emancipation was passed. Great times, great times. So Martin now has come, and, and again, we're not going to go through all his marches and everything. Martin goes to Washington, and he delivers one of the most powerful speeches he ever did. I have a dream. Martin, again, had gone with his check to be cashed. Today we can say that check has been paid in full. Paid in full. You got no more money coming from it. And the question is, what do we do with this money? After you cash a check yourself, you must invest it wisely. And that's where we are today. Take the check. It's been cashed. It's been paid by the United States government in full. The United States government owes you, 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 Nothing. The check has been paid. And you'll say, we haven't arrived. But remember what Martin said, one day we're going to go to the mountain. I may not be there with you. He was right about that. But we have arrived at the mountain. The check has been paid. Now spend it wisely. If you remember what Kennedy said, if I could steal from him, it's not what your country can do for you, it's what you can do for your country. We are Americans, and if you think that I'm wrong, the testament today, as President Obama is sworn in, we have arrived, if you want to take it black or white, as a black, you have one of everything now. You have a car, you have a lawyer, you have a doctor, you have a construction owner, you have a business owner, and now you have a president. So tell me what else is owed on that check. It is up to us, and this is again, when I look at the young people, the dream. Martin Luther King was a dreamer. The dream's over. It's become a reality. It's up to you 
as to what you take it to be. Let it be a dream that we can look down into that valley where we see the little black children and white children playing. Let it be in that valley where former slave owners and slaves now sit and drink coffee and talk about yesterday. Yesterday is yesterday. Remember what we said about Martin. I don't look backwards, I only look to tomorrow. And y'all to the tomorrow. With it today, y'all to tomorrow. So with that, I think my 20 minutes is up. And I say to you, let freedom ring, let freedom ring, let the dream continue, but the dream is over. We now have to pay. We now have to do our part. It's the freedom for all of us. It's the equality. It's the liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And I can say it again. God Almighty, God Almighty, we're free at last. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. That was wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Donald Montero, ladies and gentlemen. That was wonderful. Thank you. Donald Montero. Well, we're going to conclude with a song from uh, Sharon Mazier, and then we're going to uh, end with our traditional We Shall Overcome. Uh, I thank you all for coming. You know, uh, uh, when Martin Luther King was uh, in the Birmingham jail, uh, I always tell this story at, the, at this breakfast that they, uh, black ministers would say to him, you're embarrassing us. Why are you... Why are you doing what you're doing? You're in jail, you're embarrassing uh, the ministry. And so why are, you in the, why are you in Birmingham anyway? And he said, because this is where injustice is. And he always uh, felt that way. So uh, uh, if you see injustice, stamp it out. Uh, now, uh, thank you all for coming. I want to introduce again Sharon Mazir, uh, who is going to sing yet another song for us, and then uh, uh, share her talents with us as we sing We Shall Overcome. Sharon? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the liberty of uh, making a change. <laughs> Hopefully Milton will understand. And I'd like to dedicate it to all those who came before us. Uh, my mother will be 87 in May. My grandmother lived to be 96. And I know that all that I am and all that we are and all that they will be is because of people who came before us like Martin Luther King. And so I'm changing the song. <clears throat> so I pray that it will be blessed. It must have been cold there in my shadow to never have sunlight on your face. You were content to let me shine, cause that's your way. You always walk the step behind. Well, I was the one with all the glory, while you were the one with all the strength. A beautiful face without a name. A beautiful face to hide the pain. Did I ever tell you you're my hero? You're everything I wish I could be. And I can fly higher than an eagle. For you are the wind beneath my wings. It might have appeared to go unnoticed, but I've got it all here in my heart. I want you to know I know the truth. Of course I know it, that I would be nothing Without you, did you ever know that you're my hero? You're everything I wish I could be, and I can fly higher than an eagle, for 
for you are the wind beneath my wings. Well, if you could rise, we're going to end with our song, uh, We Shall Overcome. Uh, please don't forget that the table here is for uh, your registration for that free course, free, uh, uh, on uh, the writings and uh, ideas of Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King, Jr. I thank you all for coming. We're right on time at 1030, and Sharon's going to lead us now in our traditional song, We Shall Overcome. Those of you who remember, I'm asking that you stand, but I'm also asking that you lock arms with one another. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch the older people in the room and do what they do. <laughs> Young people, lock arms. Lock arms. Don't look around, lock arms. Men, lock arms with men. Come on now. <laughs> We shall overcome, we shall overcome, I can't hear you, we shall overcome, someday, oh deep in my Sing it like we really mean it. <laughs> we'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. We'll walk hand in hand. Someday. Oh. to sing it like you're in your church choir. <clears throat> we shall all be free. We shall all be free. We shall all be free someday. Oh, Shall overcome. We shall overcome.